Well, we are recording this tonight. Uh, had a had several reaching out uh, asking us to do this, so we're going to make this available on our website after the series is over. Um, I'm going to have to go back and record last week's, um, but we will we will have that available. Uh, we said we'd done three funerals this week, um, or this past uh, five days or so. Um, you know, it's been on my heart. Uh, man, I, I, when I do funerals, a lot of uh, sad situations when it comes to family stuff. Um, and one thing, the older I get, the more I realize that, you know, most of the words that we say, um, man, we, we always try to say the right thing and, and do the right thing. And, hey, words are important, but ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. Nothing can replace your presence. Um, nothing can replace your presence. Uh, there's just something about being there for each other. There's just, hey, I know we want to put everything off. I know it's never a good time to, you know, and in many times, we said this Sunday, Sunday night, um, when I was talking about the church and stuff, um, you know, opportunities always come at the most inopportune times, it seems like. But, you know, you hear that with kids. You know, man, they grow up and they say, hey, I, the one thing they miss or the one thing they remember is their, their parents were there or they weren't there, you know, depending on what, I mean, that's, it's just, you can't reply, you can send every note that you want. You can make every call that you want, but listen to me, don't ever take it for granted the importance of being there, being there for each other. Um, hey, I even hear it when people get saved. They tell me they're, salvation story you know what I, I can't even remember what the message was I don't even remember uh, what was said but they'll remember who took their hand and led them to the altar or who was there and it's just there's just something about it church uh, you know don't don't get so busy that you can't be there for each other hey you don't even have to say anything there's just something about our presence. And many times, people don't really need you to fix anything. They don't really need you to say anything. They just need you to be there. Um, they just need you to be there. Just don't, don't, uh, don't ever get too busy where you can't be there for each other, okay? Um, I see that a lot, and I've, I've heard it every day uh, that I... All three of those funerals, at least one time, I've heard, I, I wish so-and-so was here. Jamie, I, I, wish, I wish my aunt so-and-so was here. Um, my daughter couldn't, couldn't get away. I, I, I wish she was here. Uh, just, hey, people won't always remember what you say, but man, I, I'm telling you, there's just something about being there, okay? All right. Israel and the end. Has everybody got one of these? Does anybody not have one that needs one? All right. Um, well, I gave you this tonight really so you can... Um, there you go, Miss Brandy. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, because we're going to kind of finish what we didn't finish last week we couldn't get through everything and then I'm gonna I'm gonna share some stuff um, past that but uh, we've been talking about Israel how that plays into Islam uh, we've shared a lot of the history on all of that um, you want to hear a joke this was funny uh, it says an Islamic preacher Zakir Naik got into a taxi in London and said aloud to the taxi driver, Brother, please turn off the radio because as the Holy Quran commands, I am not allowed to listen to music. 
Because in the time of the prophet, there was no music. Especially Western music, which is the music of disbelievers, he says. The taxi driver politely turned off the radio, pulled over, stopped the taxi, and opened the door. Zakir asked him, what are you doing, brother? The taxi driver answered politely, in the era of the prophet, there were no taxis. There were no bombs. There were no shortcuts. There were no loudspeakers in the mosque to wake up newborns the elderly and the sick at eerie hours. There were no suicide bombings and there were no AK-47s. There was peace everywhere. So shut up, step outside, and wait for a camel. Amen? I thought that was uh, interesting. All right. Well, let me kind of bring you up to speed. If you weren't here Last week, I'm not going to go through everything, but let me get you. um, We opened up with Matthew 24, 1 through 8. And it's really the story of the disciples talking to Jesus, just kind of showing off the temple to him, right? How great things were and how awesome it was. And, you know, Jesus says, well, there's there's coming. He said, that looks good and all, but there's coming a time when all this is going to be gone. And sure enough, it was, right? And we, we shared that there was a Roman general by the name of Titus who came through and um, years ago uh, completely demolished the temple in and, and Israel and all those things. And so, uh, you know, the first section there, look at the signs. We just kind of talked about a few of the major signs of the uh, end times, the coming of Christ, some things that, uh, you know, are in place now. You know, the oil crisis, uh, we gave a lot of detail to that. I'm, I'm not going to uh, rehash all that, but the rebirth of the nation of Israel, um, the increase of knowledge, and then the control of Jerusalem by the Jews, very specific signage concerning um, and scriptures that go along with that, that highlight that we are uh, near the end, okay? And then... The second part was listen for the shout and give you some scripture there to kind of lead into that. But uh, why is it important, you know, to to be ready? You know, we talk about that. Um, Why why should we? Are we supposed to live in fear? No, you don't have to live in fear if you know the Lord. Uh, There's no fear at all uh, as long as you know Jesus. Um, But... uh, why that's important, you know, he's coming for those who are looking for him, uh, who are ready. Then secondly, if you're not looking, you'll be deceived. Uh, if you're not expecting the Lord, if you're putting it off, um, you will be deceived according to Scripture there. and um, You know, there's a lot of deception going on in our world even today, man. I, I mean, it seems like, uh, I mean, even... Uh, certain Christian preachers seem to be so off base, man. I mean, it's just deception everywhere. Uh, you know, Christianity is one of the most divided religions in the world. Most divided religions in the world. I, I, I mean, it, as people in Islam, you you go to Iran, you go to here in America, man, they they on the same page. About everything. But Christians, even here in America, my goodness, we're so divided, man. We spend most of our time talking about what we disagree on instead of what we believe in. Did you know there are close to over 100,000, a little over 100, I think it's like 120,000, the last counted, 120,000 different um, sex and different denominations within Christianity. Ain't that crazy? Within Protestant Christianity. And listen, all of them, they're all split and separated by 5% of the Bible. 95%, all of them believe 95%. They're all on the same page. It's about 5%, just little bitty things. But, and hey, most of it don't even have to do with theology. Most of it just has to do with government. 
how the church should be run and how the church should set up. You should have bishops. Uh, you should have a hierarchy. No, no, no. The people should, should vote the pastor in. No, no, no. The hierarchy should vote the pastor in. And I, I mean, most denominations are just split over that. What they believe scripturally is exactly the same. But can't get along just because they, 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 they can't come up with some unity about how the church should be run. Ain't that crazy? Uh, I mean, that's the world that we live in, man. Most divided it's ever been in the history of our world. Lots and lots of deception. <clears throat> we began talking about the Antichrist kind of when we just ran out of time. Uh, we shared some things concerning him. Uh, I'll kind of pick up, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, anytime you talk about the end times, everybody wants to talk about the Antichrist, right? Is he here yet? When's he coming? Uh, what's going to happen? Is the Antichrist here now? Uh, will he come while the church is still here? Um, and here's, here, here's just to kind of, uh, just to pick up so that we have a little bit of background. Uh, church, he could be here right now, but he can't, I mean, say, especially if the end is near, you know, he, he could probably already be here but he can't act in power he can't be revealed or released yet and 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 I'll show you why second Thessalonians 2 7 and 8 it says for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who holds it back that's speaking of the Holy Spirit the one who holds it back will continue to do so Till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be fully revealed. So listen to me. You see, the Antichrist can't come on the scene or at least reveal himself until the church is removed. And here's why. Because there's so much wickedness. There's so much evil that's going on, church, that never gets to us. Because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as restrainer. The Holy Spirit of God restrains so much. And you see, when the church is taken up, the ministry of the Holy Spirit as restrainer will be removed. And then the Antichrist will be revealed. Think about it. We talk about, man, the devil sure on me. I tell you, the, the evil in this world. I, man, you think it's bad now? Think about how it will be when the Holy Spirit is removed. At the, the one who restrains all this stuff. I know, hey, we live in a fallen world. Bad things are going to happen. But there's so much that don't happen. Because of the restraining of the Holy Spirit. Imagine when that's gone. I, I mean, man, you, you, you look up, if you, you get some time, man, do studies of ancient Corinth. You, you think civilizations are, are not, you, you're talking about some wicked, nasty stuff, man, I'm telling you. These ancient cities, oh, I, I mean, it, it will blow your mind that they even live that way. But that's, that's how things were. That's how people could get so so bad. I mean, the Bible says, man, back when, you remember, it, every intent of their heart was evil, it says. And I mean, and, and then the Holy Spirit comes on the scene in Acts 2, and man, things begin to kind of, I mean, the way the world looks is completely different. I mean, even, even with God leading them uh, with uh, clouds of smoke and, and all that stuff, I mean, they still couldn't get it right. And then so the Holy Spirit comes on the scene and, and things change. But man, you think things are so bad now. There's coming a time when no evil, no wickedness, none of Satan's power will be withheld. And he'll have full access, church, to do whatever he pleases. To do whatever he wants. I'm telling you, it's going to be a scary time. The removing of the church, this time... Is, is what we call the rapture. The, the, the removal of God's people. And, I, and I, we, we shared some details of all that last week. And I won't get into all that. But the Bible says that the Antichrist, when this happens, he'll have an explanation for it. 2 Thessalonians 2, it says, For this reason, 
God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe a lie. Say, what's he going to say? I don't know what he said, but I'll tell you this, they'll believe him. People people are going to think he's telling the truth. You know why? Because there's nothing to restrain. It's gone. And people are going to be deluded. They're going to be deceived. The, The Bible tells us that. They'll be deceived. God will send a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. This lie that this guy just comes out of nowhere and offers protection to Israel, offers protection, and and claims that he is the Christ, and people are going to believe it. It's going to be crazy. He'll claim to be the real Christ. And according to Revelation 13, he'll fake his death. Claim to be the resurrected Christ, and the people will believe it because of the delusion. You say, will he he be a Jew? I, I, I mean... I don't know for certain, but I think he almost has to. Daniel 11.37 says that he will show no regard for the God of his fathers. I, I, don't, I don't think that Israel people will accept anybody unless they are of Jewish descent. So almost have to be, I, I, I think. The same verse goes on to say that he'll have no desire for women. You say... You telling me he could be a saint, a homosexual? Well, he could be. Hey, 20, 30, 50 years ago, that would be impossible for anybody to have any respect of that category. Oh, but now, oh yeah, we live in a different world, don't we? Yeah. Need to look at the signs, need to listen for the shout. The scripture says that we should comfort one another with these words. Comfort one another with these words. Church, we're going to be gone. We're going to be gone. And I I don't know about you, but um, it wouldn't hurt my feelings if it was today. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why I'm pre-trib on all that. Just because uh, all, all the things that, that show with the delusion and all that stuff, um, uh, you, you know, that, that's hard. it doesn't say that during the tribulation, during the delusion, the church will be, um, will be protected from that. No, it, it never says anything like that. You know, it's not like uh, the plagues, you know, where the, the blood protected them from um, uh, from the death angel you know there's nothing that mentions that and so surely um, uh, when 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 that delusion happens and the Holy Spirit's gone I mean, the church will have to be gone uh, we, we we can't be here if we're going to be deluded or or uh, disillusioned and we'll get into some of the some of the differences uh, just for your understanding because you may have friends you know, that say, well, I, I think he's coming after the first three and a half years. I think he's coming at the end of the tribulation. Because there is different views in that. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, i explain some of that later. But <clears throat> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, and hey, when I, uh, when I get there, what, what ah, man, I, I don't know. It's going to be a great time. Uh, I know that. It's going to be a glorious time. Uh, the Bible says that, uh, man, we're going to get a glorified body. <laughs> man, I can't wait for that. Uh, amen? Mm-hmm. I can't wait for that. My, man, my body's fading fast these days. Uh, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a good time. First Corinthians, do what? I believe the largest dessert table I've ever seen will be in heaven. I believe that. I believe that. Yes. uh, No, I think it's going to be full of sugar. It just won't hurt me. (laughs) Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 53, it says, In a flash, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, imperishable, and will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. Hey, uh, you know, I've done a lot of funerals, but I've done a lot of weddings. Done a lot of weddings these days, and... You know, all the emphasis is always on the bride, right? Like it should be. One of the most beautiful spiritual events that take place on this side of heaven is a wedding. That's why I love weddings. I always make sure that I explain all the details. And Man, there's so many things that happen at a wedding that people don't even know why we do them. It's crazy. Uh, you know, just, I ain't going to get into a lot of it, but you know why you kiss Heck, it's, everybody laughs. Everybody thinks it's some kind of funny thing. And uh, people try to make a mockery out of it. But, but you know what the whole purpose of that is? Listen, when, when Adam and Eve first became a living being, they never were alive until what? It says God breathed his life into them. He formed them out of clay, but it was his breath that made them a living being. You see, when... When a husband and a wife, bride and groom, when they, when they come together, the kiss symbolizes God's breath unifying them as one, as one unit. It's such a special, special thing. Uh, that's the whole reason we kiss. How many people know that? Most people have no idea the importance of a wedding. Uh, it's one of, one of the most beautiful things that, that we have, most symbolic spiritual things that we do here on this side of heaven. But, <clears throat> but when Jesus comes, this'll, it'll be like a wedding uh, that's completely different. All of the emphasis will be on the groom who's returning for his bride. The precious son of God. And church, I want to be ready. I mean, I don't want to get weird, but I, man, I, I won't, I won't, Him to be proud of his bride. The church, the Bible says, we are his bride. Man, I I want I want him to find me in good standing when he comes back to get us. When he comes to get Bethlehem, I, I want us to be ready, man. I want us to I want him to be proud of what we've done here. I've missed out on some things. Maybe uh You've missed out on some things as a Christian. You know, with, uh, if, if you're truly walking with the Lord, you're going to sacrifice some things. And I, I would hasten to say, if, if you're not sacrificing things, that God's probably not properly where He needs to be in your life. Because I'm telling you, walking for Jesus, uh, you, you will battle. You will have some things said about you. You will have some criticism, you will sacrifice some things. There's some things you're going to miss out on. There's some things you're going to have to stand up and and be a man or be a woman, however you want to say it, and say, no, that's not my priority in my life. If you're not doing that, I'm telling you, you won't ever properly make a stand in your life. In this life that's completely after everything else, ladies and gentlemen, you will have to stand up and make some decisions and miss out on some things. And I've just reached the age where I'm okay with it. Because there's some things I want to make sure that I don't want to miss out on. There's some things that I want to make sure that my kids don't miss out on. I don't want to miss out on the singing when we get to heaven. Amen? I don't want to miss out on all the serving. that We get to serve our master forever and ever. I don't want to miss out on the sea of crystal. It's going to be beautiful, isn't it? The sights of the city, man. The, the mansion that he's building for you and for I. Man, it's going to be a tremendous time. I, I don't want to miss out ultimately on our Savior. I, man, I, I just, I don't care what picture or what, I, we, we don't know what he's going to look like, but I, I know it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful sight. 
And I don't want to miss out on all that stuff because church, we have an indebted. You ever been indebted to somebody? You ever been indebted to somebody? Th- th- think about it. I, I don't know. I'm getting a little off, but th- th- think, think about it. You, you ever, somebody just give, gave you so much, you're just like, you're just indebted to them. You know what I mean? Maybe, maybe you've been blessed to where you, you haven't needed anything, and, and, uh, and you, maybe you don't understand that. But I tell you, there's a pressure that comes along with that, church. Somebody's given you so much, saved your life, maybe, or something. Or, or there, there's no way you would have what you have if it wasn't for them, and it was something very, very important. And you feel like every time they ask you to do something, I can't tell them no, man, they saved my life. I can't, I can't say, uh, no, they, they, they want me to help them. I, I can't tell them I can't, man. They've helped me over and over and over. Church, Jesus died for you. Did you know that you would be on your way to hell if it wasn't for him? Why, do, why is it so easy for us to say, no, nah, Jesus, I can't do it. Why is it so easy for us to put other things in front of him? Like, like we don't, it doesn't even matter. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll get over it. That, that time will pass and then we'll straighten up. What, why, why is it so easy for us to do that? Church, I, I, older I get, the more I realize I'm indebted to my Savior, man. He has done so much for me. We have a debt that He paid for us. We're indebted to him. We're indebted because he intervened for us. He intervened for you at Calvary. We were the one that should suffer. We were the one that should have went to the cross, man. But he did. For you and for me. Not only that, but I mean, he don't stop there. He... Even today, He intercedes for you on a regular basis. Did you know that? God God is so holy, the Father cannot look upon sin. And so He sends His Son to die for you, to to, to make a way for for Him to understand. And so, so now we have the... The Son of God sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And He intercedes for you over and over and over. And so when you do stupid things, when you keep putting Him off. The Son's right there. Easy, easy Father. Easy. I know know what they're struggling. I know what they're feeling. Hey, this world is tough. I've, I've been through it. I know what it's like. Easy, easy. Still forgive them, Father. Still forgive them. He, not only did He intervene for us, but He intercedes over and over and over. And one day, He's going to inter- intercept us in the air. And it's going to be a glorious, happy time. And when that time comes, man, I want to be found ready. I want to be ready. I can't wait to stand on judgment day. Hear Jesus say, man, Father, this, this one's mine. No, 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 no. He, he knows you. He's given his life to you. Because you know, can you imagine us? We're going to be in line in judgment. Don't you know that? Can you imagine sitting there watching this line? Depart from me. I never knew you. Man, I get emotional thinking about that. My family, friends that I know that I, 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 I'm, every one of us is going to go to the, is going to face judgment, church. And I, I just can't imagine watching it over and over and over. Depart from me. I never knew you. Wait, wait, wait. Jesus, don't you remember me? No, no. I went to church a lot. 
No, don't, don't you know all that I gave? I don't know why I'm on this, but I am. Don't, don't, you, don't you know? Don't you remember? Depart from me. I never knew you. There will be many who come in my name declaring but they never knew me. Oh, but I'd say perhaps we're going to be giddy, but I don't know. It's probably going to be a bittersweet thing because we're going to have to see so many fall by the wayside. But with anticipation, man, what a glorious time it is when it's your turn. And Jesus says, well done, good and faithful Servant, Father, yeah, you, you let him in. He's one of ours. Oh, it's going to be a beautiful, beautiful time. There's nothing that you've received on this earth that can compare, I'm telling you, to win all our efforts, all our sufferings, all that you've gone, gone through. All that you've had to sacrifice gets rewarded, man. Knowing that forever and ever, what you've done has been worth it. All that you've had to go through, it's worth it. When he says, come on in. Mm. Let me give you that third one. Got looking at the signs, listen for the shout. But the third section is this. Logistics for the sinners. During this time, everybody wants to know, what if I get left? God help you. But just, just, I, I just, what, what, what happens? Okay. Will, will there be people saved during the tribulation? Say it were to come today, bam, boom, it's gone. The church is gone. Those that are saved, it's gone. Will, will, will there be anybody saved, pastor? Are we are going to have another chance? Well, of, of course there will be. Remember, there's two witnesses. There's going to be some things. That, that there's a purpose for them to witness. And, but listen to me very, very carefully. I wouldn't want to go through the tribulation and have heard the gospel already. You say, what, what, are you, what are you talking about? No, no, Here, here's what I'm saying. Beware of those who, who've been to church, but really anywhere in America these days. It's, it's hard to be an American and, and have not heard the gospel at some level. We, we're saturated with it. Most of you pass uh, 10 churches just to get here. I, I mean, it's, uh, uh, we're saturated with churches. There's uh, all over the television. I mean, it's everywhere. But I'm telling you, I would not want to be left and have heard the gospel. Listen, listen to this very carefully. 2 Thessalonians 2.11, 2, this is what it says. It says, for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion that they will believe the lie. So that all will be condemned who have not believed the previous truth, but have delighted in wickedness. What I'm saying is from the precious word of God. If a person who has heard the gospel already gets left, they'll, they'll be deceived by a powerful delusion. The two witnesses, we shared a little bit last week. The two witnesses are not for those who just put God off. No, they're, they're for those that, that haven't heard yet. You see, that's why, that's why when some, some guy comes to you and say, oh, no, no, J Jesus can't come back and get us because there's millions of people that's never heard the gospel. And some, oh, no, 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 no. All, all you need to do is show them this right here. Now, that's what the two witnesses are for. To, to make sure that the word gets to every one. Okay? That's, that's why what we do here. Man, it's big business. That's why I don't ever preach the gospel, church, without 
doing an altar call. That's why I don't ever share God's Word without giving people an opportunity to get saved. Because I'm telling you, if, if, if you don't do it now, you, you, you're not going to do it then. You're not going to do it then. It's too serious to play around with the truth. And man, that's why I tell you to be still. Man, this, during those times, man, that's a very serious time. Well, I'm already saved. Well, how about the person next to you? Or behind you? You never know where they're at. It's such an important, important time. This is what's going to happen. According to Daniel 9, 27, after the rapture takes place, the Antichrist will make a covenant with Israel to protect Israel. You say, well, how's that going to go down? Well, we can see how this is valid. They're going to need protection. 25 nations surround the nation of Israel and every one of them hate it. They hate Israel. They want to annihilate Israel. The population over there is 99.9% Arabs. And they are disgusted with Israel. All these terrorist attacks, I mean, they happen many times just because of the hate for Israel. The reason they happen in America. Anytime something is associated with me, it's simply because of our, our uh, um, alliance with Israel. That's what it's all about. The leaders of Iran, they have said continuously, we want Israel annihilated from the face of the earth. So the uh, rapture takes place. Church is gone. The U.S. support of Israel will weaken. You may not know this, but every year we give billions and billions of dollars to Israel. We fund all their major military. We fund all, most of their stuff. And so, uh, as, as the church leaves, America's full of Christians. America will no longer be able to support Israel at that level. They're going to need a protector. They're going to need somebody to come to their behalf. And the Antichrist will be the answer. According to Daniel 9.27, the Antichrist will break his covenant with them after the first three and a half years. And he'll demand that his image is worshipped. Say, so what's it going to be like? Well, the Bible says a fourth of the world will die because of war and starvation. The Bible says that a man will work all day for a quart of wheat. Think about it. It'll be a famine like you could never imagine. And you say, well, what, what about the Great Depression? Uh, church, I, th this is going to make the Great Depression look like a Sunday school picnic. I mean, it's, it's going to be bad stuff. People will have boils all over their body, the Bible says. People will be in so much pain. I'm not talking about in hell. I'm talking about here. It's going to be so bad. The Bible says that people will literally chew their tongues out. That's how bad it's going to be. Men will pray to die. The Bible says, and death won't come. During the tribulation, hailstones will weigh. They'll fall weighing over 100 pounds. The scripture says, woe to mothers in that day. Listen to me. You see, children will be born. They'll be born during this time. And they'll need food. They'll need medicine. But to buy and sell... Only way you can get anything is you got to take the mark of the beast. And when you do that, you've sold your soul forever and ever. You say, well, what? I mean, if I've heard the gospel and what? No, no, no. You'll, you'll, you'll take the mark just like that. Oh, it, 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 it'll just be second nature to you. Just, you know, because you want to buy, sell, whatever. You can't do any of that unless you take it. But you'll be so deluded and deceived you won't even know the difference. And as soon as you do, you seal your eternity. 
Hmm. Say, what do we do if we get left? Well, hide out. Hide out if you can. And if you've not heard the gospel, of course, according to Matthew 24, 15 and 20. But, of course, don't accept the mark of the beast. Then again, that's just for those who've never heard the gospel. I'm glad we're not going to be here. (laughs) Glad I'm not going to be here. God, uh, he didn't promise us reservation. He promised us evacuation. Amen. Let me close. Let me share some things concerning. Let me shift real quick as we finish that there. and, And we'll... The war in Israel specifically. You know, when it comes to... Israel, there's a significant promise in the Old Testament where God says, if the sun ceases to shine and the moon ceases to shine, only then will my covenant be broken. It's in Matthew 31, 35 through 37, if you want to read it there. But it's his way of saying that my covenant with them is permanent, with Israel. It's permanent, it's eternal, it's not dependent on their faithfulness. Say, man, how in the world can God keep protecting them? Over and over. That's the promise he made with them. He's not going to break his promise, church. I I mean, most most of the people in Israel don't believe Jesus was the Christ. But God's going to continue to protect. And and will will Israel lose their land? Listen to what Amos 9, 13 through 15 says. It says, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from the hills. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. And that's already happened. He did that just like he promised. And it says they'll rebuild the ruined cities. Why do they have to rebuild it? Because it was tore down completely. Remember Titus did that. Roman general completely annihilated them. It says they'll have to rebuild the cities. Okay, they did. That's already happened. And they'll rebuild the ruined cities and they'll live in them. They'll plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land that I have given them. I think they're there to stay. Isaiah 51 or 45, 1, it says this. This is what the Lord says to his anointed. To Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of to subdue nations before him and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him so that gates will not be shut. All right, so, so the nuclear deal, that's a, that's a big topic. That's an important, important facet to all this. Uh, and so if you're not familiar with that, um, just l- let, me, let me share with you. The, the nuclear agreement, um, the Iran nuclear agreement, formerly uh, known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. It's a landmark accord reached between Iran and several world powers, including, ladies and gentlemen, the United States, which took on or came on in July of 2015. Under its terms, Iran agreed to dismantle much of the nuclear program, and that was the whole deal. Uh, was that they would disarm, uh, dismantle much of their program and open its facilities to uh, more extensive um, international inspections in exchange for billions of dollars worth of sanction relief. Of course, the United States and some others, they bought it, trusted them, and they pumped the billions of dollars. That's what the nuclear deal was all about. Now, proponents of the deal said that it would help prevent a revival of Iran's nuclear weapon program and thereby reduce the uh, prospects for conflict between Iran and regional rivals, including Israel, Saudi Arabia. However, the deal was in jeopardy. You remember what happened with Donald Trump? He said, I ain't supporting that jump. What did he do? He pulled out. He withdrew in 2018. He withdrew from that. And so in retaliation for this departure from the U.S., hey, deadly attacks on all kinds of Iranians 
in 2020, including one by the United States, Iran has resumed its nuclear activities. Because of that, that was the retaliation for Trump backing out, which we never should have been in in the first place. But that's what a lot of that comes from. And so the UN inspectors reported in early 2023 that of this year, Iran had in, enriched trace amounts of Iranian of, of uranium to nearly weapons weapons grade levels, sparking international alarm. So that's what all the alarm. So President Biden said that the United States would return to this agreement if Iran came back into compliance. But after more than two years of stop and go talks, the countries are nowhere near a compromise. And so. Uh, you know, he, he keeps offering, oh, if you'll just stop, we'll, we'll get back in it, you know. But uh, obviously that's not working out. But let me explain who Cyrus was in the Bible. He was the Persian king who was in power when the Persians conquered the world power, Babylon. Now, the Babylonians had the Jews enslaved during that time. And when Cyrus conquered them, he let the Jewish people go back to their homeland. He let them take vessels back with them from their temple. He even gave them money to go back and build their homeland. And so you got to remember that he was a Persian king. Modern translation of that would be he's an Iranian king. Okay? This was Cyrus. You say, why? what's the big concern with the nuclear deal? Well, Iran is the number one sponsorship of terrorism in the world. Uh, it, I hope you know that by now. They created Hezbollah in 1982. They support and fund Hamas. All, their, all the funds and support of Hamas comes from Iran. Okay, that's where, that's where it all uh, trickles down from. They're, these are groups who literally refer to the U.S. as the big Satan and Israel as the small Satan. I mean, they hate Israel. And they hate us just as much because we support Israel. Now, I can't get into all the details, but... The U.S. nuclear inspectors, they're banned from these sites. Uh, Iran is the 18th largest country in the world. Uh, over 80 million people. And they have several nuclear sites spread out. And uh, they wouldn't even let people inspect them. That was part of Trump pulling out of the deal. Well, this ain't no deal. We, we're supposed to have access to and they, you, they won't, you won't give us access. We don't even know what y'all have. There is no deal. And so, you know, Trump says we're out. Uh, so that's, that's how all that came apart. But we, we put $150 billion back into their economy during all that time. And Iran will, they won't go on record to say what they use that money for. So we were, we were pumping money because of that deal. We were pumping all this money. And they wouldn't let us have access to the, um, to, the, to the nuclear sites. Plus, they wouldn't tell us what they were using their money for. And so people want to, uh, you know, Trump gets a lot of heat because of that. But, I mean, my goodness, uh, a deal's a deal, you know. Uh, of course, Trump's one of those guys. He don't care. Uh, he didn't think about the ramifications of that. And so he just pulls out. <clears throat> But when you, when you think about Iran, you probably think about them being Arabs. Um, but they're actually Persians. That's, that's the history. You see, modern day Iran was biblical Persia up until 1935. So what's the religion over there? Well, Iran and Iraq are controlled by Shiite Muslims. Now, Sunni Muslims make up 80%, 85% of the Muslim population, and Shiite Muslims make up 15%. But it's the Shiite Muslims that dominate Iraq and Iran. Kind of like America. We're dominated by a few. What's, what's, what goes on in the White House, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that most of the people in America do not, um, uh, do not relate to what's going on in our government. But they keep running the show, don't we? Don't they? Because we let them. Because we let them. And that's, that's the same thing 
in Iran. Only 15% of these Shiite Muslims, which are very terroristic oriented, but they're the ones that really run everything. So what, what's their big deal? Well, they believe in the 12th Imam. You see, from the start of the Islamic faith, the, the Muslim faith, the founder was a man by the name of Muhammad. We talked a little bit about him a couple of weeks ago. And they've always believed that the leader of the Muslim faith must be from the bloodline of Muhammad. So whoever leads them has to be from the bloodline. So they're, you know, they're following the same pattern. Uh, you know, David and, and Solomon and Saul, you know, had to be from the same bloodline, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so, and so the, the 12th imam lived in A.D. 874. And his name was Muhammad Abu Qasal. Supposedly, when he was five years old, he was in a cave and they lost him. And they believe that their imam has been hidden all these years. And soon he's going to rise back on the scene and reign on earth for seven years. Sound like somebody else, doesn't it? But you see, in order to bring the hidden imam back on the scene, there has to be war. Great war of bloodshed and great deaths and chaos. They truly believe that. And so that's why they live their life. That's why they fund their government. That's why everything they are, it's about conflict. It's about war. It's about death because they believe that's the spark of bringing the imam back. So when you're dealing with Iran, you've got to see some things. Now, our opening passage, I read to you. What time we got? All right. I don't see nobody moving yet. I talked about that. You know, we heard about this guy by the name of Cyrus. Remember him? He was the king. And it talks about how Cyrus will overcome the kingdom. Now, remember that Cyrus was a Persian king that overtook who? Babylon. Remember? And here's what I want you to see. When this was writing, uh, when this was written in Isaiah, it was write, written 150 years before it happened. It was even 100 years before Cyrus was born when this was written about this happening. It would be equivalent to Abraham Lincoln saying that in the year, uh, when was it, uh, like, like 1860, that he wrote some words that um, in 2023, there's going to be a president by the name of uh, Joe Biden. I mean, how crazy would that be that he would know that? But yet, that's what happened. So not only did Isaiah prophesy that Cyrus would conquer Babylon, but if you look at Isaiah 44, 28, it also prophesied that Cyrus would allow the Jewish people to go back to their homeland and rebuild the temple. And they did go back. Under the leadership of Ezra and Zerubbabel. But see this. Say, is this a long-standing feud between Israel and Iran? You say, man, this has been going on since the beginning of time. No, not really. Not, not at all. You see, up until 1978, Iran was an ally of Israel. It's crazy stuff how all this is just coming. They hadn't been at feuds forever and ever. They were an ally. You say, what happened? Well, the Rashal was the leader of Iran at the time, and he worked with the countries in the West. He actually was pro-Western nations. But there was a revolution, and the Ayatollah Khomeini took over the country, and he turned the country against America and Israel. And if then they began to refer to, it was then that they began to refer to America and Israel. Israel as the big Satan and the little Satan. And I, I'll stop there. But listen to me, church. That's why leadership is so important. That's why leadership is so important. One leader changed the entire direction of Iran. Turned them completely. I, I mean, not only were they an ally of Israel, but now they're funding terrorist groups to completely annihilate them. All because of one leader. Man, it's important who you follow. Leadership is very, very important. When the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. When the wicked are in authority, the people mourn. Hmm. Who's leading you? It matters. It matters. 
All right, we'll stop there. Um.